Welcome back everybody to the online edition of Emerging Valley. We're now going to be looking at our financing of innovation and startup session in an era of COVID-19. We're going to be looking at the resilience lessons and post-pandemic perspectives for the Pan-African continent. We're going to be joined by a number of well-known business angels and investors from West Africa and French-speaking Africa, but also English-speaking Africa and East Africa as well. So I would like you to welcome and I would like to digitally thank um, these uh, speakers. We can applaud them at distance. This is Kenza Lahul, who is founder of Outliers which is a Pan-African investment fund based in Casablanca. Mariam Diop as well, who is the principal investor of Orange Ventures. Cyril Collon as well, who is general partner of Partec Africa. Thank you very much, Cyril, for being here today. Pierre Fauvé as well, who is managing partner of Creadev. Creadev is an investment fund that is very involved in West Africa, particularly in Kenya. We also have Jeremy Adjenberg, who is managing director of the Investisseur et partenaire fund. It's difficult to present investisseur et partenaire. They've been part of the furniture here for many years. They've had so much investment, particularly in venture capital in Africa. Thank you very much, Jeremy. And we also have uh, remotely joining us today, we've got Tommy Davis, who is president of the African Business Angels Network, who will also be giving his point of view on the role of African business angels in the face of COVID-19. This fourth edition of Emerging Valley is carrying on with this tradition. Since the start of the event, we had um, a main section on funding in the first day. We listened to GIS, European Union, African Union, Campbell, Expertise France, and now we're going to be hearing from investors committed and working on the ground with startups. And despite the crisis, we've seen that African tech has managed to draw in a lot of funding keeping, um, if we look at the Partech Africa report figures, thank you Cyril for the work that you're doing every year compiling this data. This has shown us that despite COVID-19, there was a 44% increase in fundraising compared to 2019. And this dynamic shows that we have gone up a level in Investors are believing more and more in the potential of the African continent, regardless of COVID-19. And in some way, the arrival of COVID-19 was a re revelation um, for some sectors such as e-health. We're going to be looking at some of these perspectives with our prestigious panel of investors on the ground. I'm going to start. Um, Cyril, um, let's start with you. We can see that Partec Africa, thank you very much for being there, has been documenting the progress, this almost exponential progress in fundraising in the Pan-African continent, uh, especially in venture capital. Um, in this year of COVID, there's been a much better result generated, which was quite even more optimistic than the catastrophic uh, scenario we could have envisaged. How do, can you explain this African exception, this good result today when we could have expected a dramatic decline in investment in the African continent? Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you very much, Samir. I'm really delighted to be with you here today. As you reminded us, there were 44% greater transactions. This is huge. This was over, we've seen an explosion over the past five years. It's very extraordinary in a context where other continents are not experiencing this same dynamic. There have been lots of responses to explain this. I think that this year of pandemic has really revealed the huge resilience of our tech partners and stakeholders, their ability to adapt and to build within a difficult context. 
building companies with a pan-African mission. And the reality is that international stakeholders during COVID, we had um, a, a record 1.5 tech companies in Africa. Many of them have positioned on the continent last year. I think this is a real validation internationally of the health of our ecosystems here. Another perhaps more interesting point is that I think the attractiveness of the risk return profile of African startups, particularly if you look at the seed and early stages. To give you a bit of international context, we need to understand that elsewhere in other con continents, um, Asia, Europe, we have advancing in inequity in capital and this is actually um, leading to early stage deployments they need mass funding there's greater visibility they've got private equity public and, and private markets so there's a lot less seed funding a lot less capital venture we've got a funding gap in Africa so it's the opposite and the um we've got a we've got a this gap which means that the seed phase um is much more vital we we had a, a bit of a break um in term last year in terms of volume but if we look at the seed market itself it's very he it's got a very healthy structure with unrivaled opportunities We've got entrepreneurs that are very talented looking at structural problems in the continent. We've got market perspectives that are all more or less uncapped in terms of size across the entire continent. And on the other side, we saw a huge range of creation of utilities allowing all stakeholders in the chain from business angels, seed funds or venture funds, finding exit strategies and there was a real performance potential across the entire continent and the fact that they can that they can exit growth tickets, fun, seed funds, we've got a real M&A strategy here as well which is allowing them to position themselves and these are incredibly good indicators for the continent. Last year we had 443 investors positions in these transactions. This is great. It's not slowing down. So it's great news for us. Thank you very much, Cyril. We can see this resilience and you've really illustrated that through your figures. This was a reality in the sector. But could we also talk about a COVID effect if we look at the issue of portfolio? Has this impacted portfolios or funds? Have you had to change strategies to get better security? I'm going to go over to you, Kenza Lahlu. Um, you are at the, the head of outliers. You've got a pan-African overview of this. In, in 2021, is there a COVID effect on deals as deals are often uh, negotiated over several months and funding funds have got delays in their own fundraising. So to start off, good afternoon everybody. Thank you very much Samir for inviting me. It would be interesting to remind everybody that lots of investment has been, been happened. So Outliers is an African fund that invests in tech companies and transforms traditional industries. What Cyril was talking about, these fundamental industries such as fintech, logistics, supply chain, supply chain across four main markets in Morocco where we're based, but also Egypt, Nigeria and Kenya. We have a portfolio of eight companies at the moment and in, across the industries that I've mentioned and for us, it was very reassuring, even positive, to see how the crisis had a positive impact on our company's growth. It depends on the sectors, obviously, but I think that digitalization 
was promoted and benefited from this crisis, particularly with lockdowns and the fact that we could not move around and access services. So this has pushed the digitalization of big groups and businesses, but also the adoption of new consumer habits. So for e-commerce, but also H-Tech that we were talking about, health tech, we're digitalizing the supply chain and logistics and fintech as well. This is an important sector that was positively impacted. All of these examples show that at the end of the day in Africa, in any case, in some key sectors, the COVID effect was positive. And to come back to your question on the time that it, it takes to close deals, it was actually accelerated in our experience, the fact that we did not need to take a flight and meet with people in person. We actually saw that the speed was quicker. Entrepreneurs are making the most of this in a single day. They can line up multiple calls with different investors located in different regions and close deals a lot more quickly. So. I would say that we have a faster pace. We don't have this latency due to travel and funds are starting to close deals remotely, which means that competition is growing because we have had American funds, Chinese funds, etc., that are starting to invest increasingly without having to travel. And just to finish off um, with these funding funds, it depends on the type of investment. For DFIs, they have not had any problems with this, generally speaking. They're already secured funds for VC. So there's large investment amounts and over a long period of time, for those that were already in ongoing, it has not had any effect on their capacity of, of investment. I think that overall, the picture is very positive. Thank you very much for this testimonial from the ground, Kenza. I see that Mariam Diop is with us now. Mariam, could you say in a few words, you, you lead in the investments of the Orange Digital Ventures Funds. Could you explain what is unique about this structure, what's its DNA, what's its priorities, and then to come back to the COVID crisis now, how has the crisis led you to change your strategies? Thank you very much, Samir, for this invitation. Hello to my colleagues. I'm delighted to see you, even if it is remotely. Orange Ventures is the um, international fund under the Orange Group, we actively invest in Europe, Israel, America, and we've now successfully started to invest in Africa. During the crisis last year, we announced our spin-off. We became Pilor, an independent fund with $300 million, million to support international funds. This is an an independent fund, but we also have an independent governance in that as well. So for Africa, we have a 50 million envelope to invest in startups on the continent on the basis of a number of criteria, people experiencing fast growth, looking to solve fundamental problems through innovative technologies and who are led by, by um, entrepreneurs. We generally have variable tickets up to uh, 5 million in Series A and B, and the investment themes are generally aligned with the strategic priorities of Orange for the continent, fintech, connectivity, digital solutions, e-health now, and many others. We have a portfolio of around 30 companies at the moment, around 10 of which are operating in Africa. And I will talk later about what we've launched to fund uh, companies through seed funding. The DNA of Orange, as, as you know, 
we have a very important place in development of the digital ecosystem in Africa because telecoms operators have a lot of assets that are essential for startups, distribution networks, APIs, connectivity, payment solutions as well. So this means that we are a vital player for innovation and tech management in Africa. And this puts us at the forefront of digital revolution. This also justifies our motivation to invest in startups. These startups can dr make the most of all of our assets in order to accelerate their growth. And we give them access to markets across 18 countries in Africa in which Orange is operating. With regard to the health crisis, I'm not going to say what Cyril and Kenza have already said, but I think we should remind you that before the crisis, the world economies, the biggest growth were in Africa, in West Africa, it's around um, 55%. Tech um, fundraising increases and the interest that foreign investors had in continents were factors that showed us that tech and its success had gone much far beyond what we had five or ten years ago. And with the crisis, uh, Africa has been less impacted than Europe and the rest of the world, but the impact on the economy is still significant. I think for businesses, it is first and foremost an negative effect leading to them having to take out mass loans more than in the last five years in any case. We've seen a 10% increase in loan funding. At Orange, we paid special attention to solutions that we could propose during the crisis. The operator in, in Africa, we have um, a very good position as a telecoms operator. Africa is very important generally in the res in the group's results. This is the zone that is pulling growth upwards. This became apparent during the crisis. We based our response around three points. First of all, providing emotional support for all of the companies in our portfolio. We spoke with them more regularly and supported them in another way than just funding. And we then assessed the most urgent funding needs. We had a fast track process in place in order to provide funding more quickly. That represented around 50% of our portfolio who had a bridge loan. And the third point, during the cr crisis, we launched a seed fund for new businesses, particularly businesses that had been uh, damaged by the crisis in order to meet some, some gaps. This is between um, seed and early stage funding. We invested variable tickets. But 50,000 and 150,000 in seven startups, primarily based in the countries in which Orange operates. Thank you very much, uh, Mariam. That's a uh, very comprehensive and it uh, goes well with what uh, Kenza and Cyril have just said. We're going to stay in this topic of resilience and um, lessons learned and best practice. I'm now going to go to Jeremy. You lead the Investisseur et Partenaire Fund, which supports other funds, investment funds across the continent. I even have seen many of them by EMP F F2, for instance. How are your funds and this coalition of IMP funds coped with this very difficult year? And what advice do you have? What best practices have you learned to achieve resilience during this very unique pandemic? Hello, Samir, I'm delighted to be with you. 
you are right to remind us that Investisseri Partenaire invests in many different ways. We directly invest th through funds f that are uh, uh, about 5 million upwards, but we also co-create with African professionals country by country with um, smaller equity investors for 100,000 to 500,000 euros. Around two years ago, we had nine seed funds launched that were even smaller. These were loans for new businesses looking between 50 and 150,000 in investment. Specifically, we support funds that support companies in Ivory Coast, Madagascar, etc. And for them, it was very difficult this past year. There was a real shock at the start. What's going to happen? The portfolios were starting to collapse. Companies. We don't just fund tech companies, if we're in agri-food, health with tech or other tech companies. There was this emotional shock and we had to try and support the fund managers whilst they were supporting the entrepreneurs. We implemented specific uh, communications for our fund managers. We supported those supporting others, implementing their health restrictions that are so difficult to keep going over time. We've reviewed corporate strategies and particularly cash flow management because people uh, soon realized that that was going to be the biggest challenge. We supported investment funds in revving back up uh, their strategies and their funding in Africa and elsewhere. And we did notice a certain slowdown in our investment in 2020, but that is starting again in 2021. We did continue to invest in 2020, but there was a slowdown in our approaches and the physical possibility of doing things was slowed down. We also learned a lot. We learned how to support entrepreneurs to adapt. It's, it's not necessarily about leading or not doing anything. We needed to adjust in our way of producing and talking about this. We've learnt a lot with equity managers. We continued to invest in countries where there is very little investment, and I will come back to that later on. Yes, thank you very much. Later on, we're going to be talking about the geographical distribution of investment. Later, I'm going to go to you now, Pierre Fouvet, Managing Director of CREADEV, which is an investment fund that is very active in East Africa. You're based in Nairobi. You have some amazing success stories, Twigger Foods, Spark Schools. What are your investment criteria and how were you impacted how were your criteria influenced by COVID-19? Hello everybody, hello Samir and thank you very much for this invitation. Congratulations to all of the Emerging Valley organizers for this excellent event. Yes, I'm working out of Nairobi. I hope that the internet connection will be sufficient. We're covering all of Sub-Saharan Africa with the same objective as uh, the other creative offices in Shanghai, New York, etc. To We want to support entrepreneurs to become champions, billionaires within the ecosystem alongside Decathlon, Le Roi Merlin, etc. All of these brands that you know. In Nairobi, we're at the start of our story. We're trying to create a sort of pyramid with three levels. The bottom level will have 10 African startups that have already confirmed in which we're going to invest between 30, 3 and 30 million and then other entrepreneurs 
that are going to go up a level to become pan-African, where we're going to be investing more time and resources in synergy and, and equity between 50 and 100 million per company. And then we want one or two entrepreneurial uh, adventures that are going to become these billionaire companies with even more support. This is ambitious, but we have time for that. We're working in the long term. We're going to be able to find these pearls and invest in them. To answer your question on criteria, are you an entrepreneur with your feet on the ground and your head in the sky with essential services that you're providing to as many people as possible, say for access to food? So is Peter Angel, which is looking at Twigger's excellent growth at the moment, or access to education, like Stacey Boer looking after Spark Schools at the moment, developing innovative teaching for 15,000 students and teachers in South Africa, or access to healthcare, and I'll talk about that later. Do you have a team? This is the second question. To carry this dream with you, do you have a proof of concept of sustainable growth and a deep market? If that is a yes to all those questions, then we need to talk. And to answer your second question, these criteria whether or not they've changed with the pandemic. No, they haven't, because we're lucky to be long term in our thinking. So we're trying to mitigate the effects of this crisis. And the second point is that this pandemic has reinforced our conviction that health, education, access to food is essential across the entire continent. And many here know the figures better the number of vaccinations, the number of students that have not been able to go to school in Kenya. We had a whole year, there were 300,000 people um, in South Africa unable to go to school. We've had a food budget in health, sorry, in um, the daily allowance, which is below 50%, which is huge. We've got a lot of structural issues. Cyril, Cyril was talking earlier about getting behind our champions. I don't think the changes in the criteria, but in the support which we're now giving at, at CreaDev, we're trying to provide more support now. In Spark School, the schools were closed, so it's not necessarily easy. But we've been trying to push forward synergies. And I was very impressed by the fact that Peter and Stacy, our entrepreneurs, were able to um, put in a lot of energy to come out of this crisis. And I know that many of us around the panel here have experienced a similar thing. Um, your connection was great. So I, we've been talking about fundraising and often this is something that's very disincarnate. These are dreams, these are men and women and entrepreneurs and the success stories that you're talking show the impact that we can have on everyday life. When we're talking about fundraising, we're talking about essential work. I like the Partec Africa report, but behind these figures and these curves, there's impact, there's humans and this is what brings the real wealth. We can see that you are very passionate and we can see why you're passionate. It's not about the figures, it's about the impact that you're having on entrepreneurs through the figures. Thank you very much, Pierre. We were able to interview Tommy Davis earlier. I don't think we need to introduce him. I think you all know him, but I'll introduce him for our audience. He is founder of the Africa Business Angels Network and he's going to answer three questions how business angels have managed this pandemic, what was their role, how startups have been able to rely on business angels across the continent. And we are then going to be able to continue uh, debate. Over to Tommy Davis. <laughs> well, um, the Africa Business Angel Network uh, currently has about 50 different networks in 33 African countries. And our investment portfolio by these networks is very, very varied because, as you can imagine, it depends on what part of Africa the network is in. So you have the Anglophone networks in places like Nigeria and Kenya. You have the Francophone 
networks in places like Senegal, Côte d'Ivoire, uh, and even Mali. And then, of course, you've got North African networks in places like Egypt and Tunisia, and the southern networks in places like Namibia and South Africa. And in terms of the types of professionals, it is people, I, I say the rule of thumb is if you're already a landlord, okay, and you have tenants, then you're probably ready for angel investing because it means that you have disposable income that is worth investing. And that is how uh, we sort of use the rule of thumb for that. I trust that helps. Well, I, I don't think anybody can actually answer the like for like numbers because VCs are institutional, but we have seen a growth uh, with the Africa Business Angel Network creating with others the Africa Angel Academy, um, which actually trains angel investors. We're seeing an increasing number of angels. And in terms of trends, what is happening is the good news for us is the the uh, entrepreneurs that have exited or sold their companies are becoming angels. So if you look, for example, Inya Boyaji has done Future.Africa, Jason Njoku has done Spark, uh, Bosun Tijani is doing the CC Hub Syndicate, and in Cairo, we've got the Cairo Angels Fund. So we're seeing an increased activity around angel investment from those who have already made money as entrepreneurs on the continent. So that is the major trend we are seeing in angel investing. Well, I mean, it, it's funny that um, what emerged out of COVID for us in 2020, uh, in my particular case, uh, um, were the creation of two new networks um, that are specific to that. So for the Anglophone, if you remember what I was speaking about earlier, we have the Diaspora Angel Network, which looks at Anglophone diaspora and co-investment into Kenya, Nigeria, and the Anglophone countries. And likewise, funnily enough, out of Paris, uh, by the way, Dan is out of uh, London. Out of Paris, we have the Bridge Angels that is looking at Francophone diaspora, invested in Francophone Africa, so in Tunisia, in Morocco, in Dakar, and uh, Francophone cities in Africa like that. So that's been the Angels' response to COVID, is the expansion of our capability to embrace those in diaspora to increase the amount of capital that angels are able to deploy on the continent. Tommy Davis, we've had uh, Mr. Davis at Emerging Valley over the last few years. So he was unable to be with us here today, but uh, fortunately he was able to record himself answering our questions. So thank you very much, Mr. Tommy Davis. I would like to then move on to talking about the aftermath of COVID. But before doing so, I would like to come back to talking to Jeremy. We have 22, count 22 countries in Africa that are sharing over 280 million euros of investment. There is Af South Africa, Egypt, Kenya, which have many opportunities to attract investors. Is this a basic trend that you think will not change? Or do you think that over the years, uh, there will be a lot more um, diversification in terms of investment for in uh, French speaking investors? I think that this change is something that we will potentially be seeing. Yes, it's difficult to say though, but this is not just uh, unique to Africa. This is the same story all over the place.
we need to have investors that show that it is possible to continue investing in the context of COVID. So we need to congratulate ourselves that uh, any, anywhere is growing at the moment, quite frankly, because COVID is making things so difficult over the last 10 years, we have seen steady growth in terms of investment. And I think that my co colleagues will agree with me when I say that uh, we are very much privileged to be in a position to be able to invest in countries because we, well, for, for one thing, we have to not get discouraged by the failures. We need to focus more on the success stories. We are very proud to have so many good partners with us who are in good networks and who will be able to continue financing companies in, for example, Mali. We have young Malian professionals who are even coming back from living overseas, coming back to Mali and are being the first people to come up with ideas like uh, new Uber-like apps for taxi drivers. It's a very big mission they like to try and uh, propose good working conditions to their taxi drivers in Madagascar we've been able to influence and invest uh, a a SaaS solution for companies to implement artificial intelligence programs and projects and this is something that we're very proud to be a part of as well we've been helping them manage their stock as well. It's a, a, a magnificent project in the Madagascan climate. Today, someone is going to be investing in a company in, Coat, in uh, Ivory Coast as well, one of my partners, and this will be answering certain issues of digitalization in the country. So we can see that it's absolutely possible we have amazing teams who have identified solutions that are available on the market at the moment and that need to be uh, taken advantage of and used. We are also very proud to have uh, invested in a company in Senegal as well, as well as across the rest of West Africa with certain partners uh, in America as well. It I'm talking about a platform that helps people share online e, e online e learning resources, both in Mali, Madagascar, and Ivory Coast. Uh, we think I very much hope that uh, the colleagues that I have here with me today will be able to confirm what I'm saying that uh, scaling up is an essential part of any business, and thankfully we are all lucky enough to be able to be a part of it today. So we have 10 minutes left. I'd like to talk about the aftermath of COVID. Kenza, what kind of trends are you seeing in your portfolio at the moment? We have already mentioned digital transformation. Uh, companies are already doing so. But do you think that we have a few more quarters which will be difficult to go through? Yes, absolutely. I think that the, the future will be a tricky time. But we have been lucky. The thing is, though, there are two elements. We are lucky because we are very fortunate to be working in companies that actually raises funds and actually was doing so up to and including the beginning of the crisis. And we've been able to continue um, supporting the startups that we work with. So they're very lucky as well. The other aspect of why we are so lucky is that we have continued being able to look at opportunities and the fundamental problems that they resolve. When we have companies that are using technology to transform key sectors with fundamental needs, even before COVID, they actually have not seen their business operations decrease. If anything, it's done the opposite. They've actually accelerated. So that's very poignant. For everything with to do to do with supply chains, obviously that's been affected for consumers and for suppliers. We are trying to work on transforming these sectors as well. We have one in uh, Kenya, in, Af in Eastern Africa, and another that is in Morocco, that is very much part of this model and actually model and actually saw that the crisis was an opportunity, been able to transform their entire supply chain and their 
value chain, they distribute 80% of the uh, food that is that is produced locally to local communities. So this is something that is continuing to happen even today. How have local producers responded to, th responded to this? Well, the amount of merchandise that they're producing has actually exploded. And so the thing is, quite funny, is actually to say that uh, these, com these producers and these companies have actually benefited from the crisis. The other trends that we are seeing are for fintech. For instance, we have an investment in Nigeria in a company called Bamboo that actually helps Nigerians democratize the access to investment. So, for example, uh, with regard to the stock exchange, which has absolutely exploded locally, this, is, this has enabled local companies to gain access to much more opportunities than before. This is really an exceptional level of growth and the number of opportunities that the crisis has created is incredible as well. There is also health tech is another part that we work on. This has actually been positively impacted, seeing as there are a lot more needs to access healthcare online. So. Absolutely, we have these, these, these several different sectors which have actually been able to benefit from the crisis with regards to logistics or transport. Of course, that these are, some of these are uh, more niche uh, sectors which can be affected by the um, need to leave countries and go across borders. I'd like to talk about the rhythm of investors at the moment. In the number of investments that have been made has actually gone up. And this is where we'll be able to see, I think, the trend continuing into 2021. This is something that which we very much hope will be the case. Thank you so much, Kenza. I'd like to come back to what you say by asking the same question to Mariam. And maybe she can tell us about how things are going at Orange. What kind of trends are you seeing at the moment? Do you think that uh, investors are more reluctant to invest in companies? Have, is, is this something that you've seen in your portfolio of companies? What can you tell us about that, please? Thank you very much, Samia. Just to complete what Kenza has said, I would say that actually things are pretty much getting back to normal. <clears throat> Obviously, uh, the due diligence that is being done at the moment is all completely linked to c the COVID crisis, and this has had an impact on investors, of course. A lot of the investments that are being made at the moment have been impacted uh, very much, but it's more for me, I think, about a question of finding the balance between the social impact that one can have by giving uh, investment to a company, uh, specifically in Africa. But I think that actually startups in the continent are actually doing fairly well. We have some exceptional examples such as, okay, the feed has cut off. I'm afraid that the connection has cut off. We can no longer hear the speaker. We're gonna move on to the next speaker though. Oh, okay, we're back. Okay, the connection is being re-established. What was I saying? You were talking about investments. Yes, I was talking about the Yoko example. We have some exceptional examples that have managed to ride the wave of the crisis very, very well. Yoko have really been extremely resilient and that's helped them recover 80% of their income that they lost during the crisis, certainly at the end of last year. And now they've actually been able to bounce back and get to a similar level of income that they were having this time last year, even beforehand. So we have managed to focus on the most resilient startups, those who have real needs in Africa. And uh, But the thing is, unfortunately, there are some startup companies that have not been able to bounce back just as well. They've not been able to um, have the same kind of results as Yoko, 
we have uh, health sector, agri tech, fintech as well. Some of these stump, uh, some of these sectors with uh, startups in have not necessarily been as successful, but. Um, I'm just going to come back to what Jeremy was saying earlier on. Apart from Egypt, Nigeria and South Africa, which have very uh, developed markets for startups, I would say that I actually agree with what Jeremy was saying. There is a way for markets to grow and to internationalize, to provide opportunities to local stakeholders. 2021 has shown that investors investors still have a very large appetite and they want to continue investing. I'm going to ask one more question to Cyril and Pierre. In just one minute, could you please tell us about um, the COVID and how it has potentially strengthened the impact of investment for st African startups. In just one minute, could you wrap up, please? In one minute, well, that's going to be tricky. So the first thing I would say is that, yes, bouncing back. Well, we have invested in essential businesses such as access to food. This has uh, been embodied by the company Twiga, as well as in the retail sector. We've been seeing that uh, users are actually consuming differently. Access to education is another sector as well, but we need to be careful of this because it is just so important now with uh, the closure of schools. I would say that, um, well, I don't know if I would agree with the fact that investments have necessarily been strengthened by the COVID crisis. I think that obviously it's had a big impact on um, the willingness of investors to part with their money. Of course, there's going to be an impact, but I don't think that um, it would necessarily is necessarily going to continue uh, once the COVID crisis has passed. I would say that it's important to really emphasize the resilience of business models. It's tricky though because you need to trade off between um, finding the winning combination for everyone. Thank you very much, Pierre. Finally, over to Cyril to wrap up this session. In your opinion, for Partec and your vision on a day-to-day -day basis, do you think that we are already bouncing back or do you think that we need to wait a bit longer? Well, in my opinion, I absolutely think that we are already bouncing back. I'm very optimistic about 2021. The beginning of 2021 has been very strong. We've had very good results. I would say that actually, uh, in a way, the COVID crisis has been a kind of break during which we've been able to go back and look at the strategies that we've been implementing over the last few years. And now we have uh, managed to come to some conclusions about how we're going to continue investing in the future. And we're doing this more than ever, the more than we ever have done so in the past few years, when we might not necessarily have had enough time. We're looking at global markets. It strengthened people's willingness to work together. It strengthened solidarity. We have good numbers. We've had good figures that are very coherent. Uh, then that are showing us that actually we're having a, a very good start to the year. I would. Or would say I would also say that we haven't actually had any mega deals so far on the market in 2021, uh, but uh, recent well in the past few years we've had three mega deals with millions and millions of euros that have been invested. These three mega deals. Um, I can't go into too many details about them, but um, it's a very good sign in any case. For certain sectors, we see that they're actually doing very well, specifically for agri-tech and food processing. We have uh, overall 80 million euros that, be invest that are being invested in agri-tech. Nigeria is still the epicenter with a, a DNA, an end DNA that is very much focused on fintech. They have a good level of financial services and lots of companies that are very much involved in the sector. 
Egypt is still around, is still a big player in the Francophone part of Africa. That's something which is quite interesting and something that was actually being emulated in Morocco and Tunisia. Just to wrap up, I would like to give an example for uh, Partec Africa. At the moment, we are looking at four new companies that we want to integrate into our portfolio. I think that by the end of April, we would have sealed these deals. And so you can see that we're actually still being very active, even despite the context. So the dynamics are there, the energy and the motivation and the willingness are there too. So I'm very optimistic about the rest of the year. And I think that the dynamic that we've already seen in 2019, 2020 will not be too damaged or too influenced, impacted by COVID. I think that we're going to bounce back and we're already doing so. Well, that's great to hear. I'm so glad. Thank you very much, Mr. Cyril Colon. And thank you very much to the rest of the panelists as well to giving us your inside insights. Thank you very much to Tommy Dezis, the Chief Investment Officer at the African Business Angel Network, Mariam Job, Pierre Fauvé, Cyril Colon, Jeremy Hagenberg, Pierre Fauvet, who is the Managing Director of Africa, uh, Africa Director of Creative International. Thank you so much for your confidence and thank you for participating in this fourth edition of Emerging Valley. Your testimonials are absolutely paramount to giving us uh, an inside look into how the situation really is in Africa. Thank you very much. La force, l'énergie, la lumière, un territoire, une vision. inspecter les gestes de Welcome to those of you joining us. It is a pleasure to be able to talk with all different stakeholders from the ecosystem on the future relationships between Africa and Europe through digital technologies. We're going to be talking about biodiversity. We've talked about the territory and also the role of Provence and Marseille, this department as a laboratory of innovation, a laboratory of biodiversity 2.0 between the African continent and European continent for this Euro Med Africa axis. We need to know that everything is interconnected and linked. We're facing a global pandemic at the moment with economic and health impacts 
many studies have told us that this is a this is because of a uh, disconnect between nature and ourselves with this zoonosis these these animal based illnesses the contact with humans and ecology means that an increasing number of pandemics are likely to come in the future and are going to be very likely in the coming decades talking about biodiversity with us today we have partners from the Bouche du Rhône département uh, Didier Réo who is vice president of the departmental council of the Bouche du Rhône and president of the national park of the Calanque thank you for being there with us thank you for inviting me we're also lucky to have Patricia Rica who is president of the oceanographic Paul Rica Institute I think that the Emerging Valley community know her well now. She's a friend that has been with us over many years. Thank you very much for your support. Thank you. Hello and well done for this initiative. Thank you. And we also have Sarah Toumi with us, who is a member of the Presidential Council for Africa. Where is she? She is here. Hello, Sarah Toumi, who is calling out of Tunis right now in Tunisia. Thank you very much for being with us. And you're going to be talking about your experience and what you're doing on biodiversity. We also have Jean-Marc Philippe. Good afternoon, Jean-Marc. You are president of Oshun and sales director of the Canal de Provence Society, which works a lot in water and is developing very strong links with African local authorities, particularly in Senegal. And you'll be able to say um, more about that later on. I'm delighted to be with you here today. Thank you, Jean-Marc. Finally, we have Valérie Noël Codjol Diop. I can see you. Thank you very much for being with us here remotely today. It is always a pleasure to see you. You are innovation manager for the Africa region and the overseas region and the Mediterranean region for Société Générale. Hello, Valérie Noël. It is always a delight to see you. And what we need to specify as well is that we have worked a lot to prepare this plenary session with collective intelligence, with a lot of different um, departments, the um, Patricia Rica, Lanzi Med, AFD, New Development Funds from Esther Duflo, incubators, accelerators from CMA, CGM, Director of Oceans, Ocean Hub Africa, and many others. Kedge was also working. We had a lab, an intelligence, collective intelligence lab organized yesterday on the shared innovations between Africa and Europe for protection of oceans and biotech. So Didier Rio, uh, Vice President, you uh, actively participated in this three hour workshop. This lab was a real exercise of collective intelligence, thanks to IRD, etc. And there were a lot of major ideas that came out of this in how to strengthen cooperation between startups, local authorities, support from incubators and how to put that into practice here in Marseille with Marseille is going to have the IUCN Nature Congress and the next summit of the two shores. So I'm going to ask uh, Didier Réau to, after bringing together all these stakeholders, what um, does the Bouche du Rhône département have in order to promote this lobbying? What are the main lessons that you've learned? Why did you have this shared reflection with all these different European, Mediterranean and African stakeholders? Good afternoon, everybody. Why did we want to come together to talk about biodiversity? Well, first and foremost, because we can't be right by ourselves. We can't have all the best ideas just by ourselves. Regardless of the good ideas we had, we need a whole chain of leaders and proposals in order to move forward in these areas. This is true for biodiversity, but it's also true for all topics, for economy, social, uh, all areas of our lives. And I think that the title itself, Collective Intelligence Lab, reveals what we did. 
and in order to find solutions and proposals from our discussions, we firstly needed to agree on the topics that we're going to be talking about. Biodiversity is a general theme, but within that, we've got so many different inputs that impact biodiversity and so many consequences that can be positive or negative of biodiversity development. So we needed to agree with applied and fundamental researchers, project leaders, any startups, financial supporters, policy makers in order to work on this issue. We had four topics. So what subjects were we going to actually work on? When we did our exercise, our digital post-it notes, if you like, we found nine. So we had to choose four topics. We voted. And I think that we were all aware of the importance of these four topics. And we were all able to work on them at their own individual levels. In the Bouche du Rhône département, there's this Mediterranean coastline. We see Africa and we can see the Marseille capital there. There's a real relationship between Marseille, Provence and all African countries. The département is able to work with Africa because of this. And for biodiversity as well, this is the number one, the, the first um, d department to have 30% of Provençal territory to be natural areas. We've got a large regional park. We've got the Calanque. We've got the biggest lagoon in, in Europe. And we're trying to renature that lagoon at the moment, the Eton de Bear. Um, it's a very rich area in terms of biodiversity in the land and marine areas. So we can provide experience as managers of natural spaces with the Conservatoire du Littoral to show how we work. Perhaps we're not perfect, but we have experience that is majoritarily positive and we are able to export that, if you like. We can export the little intelligence that we have. I don't know if you have little intelligence, but in any case, you're going to be coming back later to reveal which four topics you worked on. But um, I'm, uh, we're talking about this lagoon. Um, we have uh, our friend from Abidjan who is joining us, Ange Balma, who had uh, connection problems. Ange Balma, who's founder of Cinelux, which is a great startup in clean tech and uh, is setting up a great business close to the camp here in Aix-en-Provence. And Ange, I hope that this time your connection will be good. We're going to hand over to you later on. We're going to try and uh, solve these connection problems. I'm going to go over to Sarah Toumi. You're in Tunis, in Tunisia at the moment. You were present in the, this lab. What did you learn from that? And why is it really important, in your opinion, to have this um, overarching approach. You are very involved in, you're in the MEIO oh, with the 2030 Mediterranean approach. You think that you need to change approach. We need to have coalitions of stakeholders. Could you tell us a little bit more about that in five minutes, if possible? Yes, of course. Thank you very much, Samir. Hello, everybody. So, yes, I, I attended this uh, into collective intelligence lab yesterday. Startups, innovators, researchers, small and med medium um, enterprises, banks, funding organizations, local authorities, everybody was represented in this laboratory where we talked for three hours. Everybody was very motivated because we are all aware of the fact that nobody has the solution to solve environmental problems in the Mediterranean or anywhere else in the world. What we need today is to create synergies between stakeholders. What was very interesting after this lab was to see the expectations and the contributions that everybody had. So, for example, researchers were saying we're capable of providing knowledge 
We're able to raise awareness, train different people with regard to biodiversity, but we need funding, we need help on how to respond to calls for projects, how to get access to scientific knowledge and how to work with startups in order to innovate or with civil society in order to innovate. The entrepreneurs were saying, we've got a tried and tested business plan, but we need a seed fund. We need places where we can test our technology in order to prove through pilot projects that it works. And on that basis, they would be able to, to get funding in order to scale up. That's the real challenge. We need to accelerate the scale up of all of these technologies that exist across the Mediterranean in many different places. And the funders were saying, we can provide funding, but we need training, we need awareness raising, we need support. So it was very interesting and it shows that there are very complementary needs. And by implementing these the discussion between these different stakeholders, we're able to provide proposals, as, as Didier was saying just now, that are solutions that could change the game when, with regard to, Medi to Mediterranean biodiversity. Thank you very much, Sarah. I know that you are um, following that very closely through the Presidential Council for Africa rethinking the relationship between France and Africa. We're going to come back to this coalition later, but I would like to talk to Valérie Noël now. Valérie Noël, you are really in innovation and disruptive technology at the moment. You're carrying this topic of innovation with others within a, a large corporate uh, Société Générale. We often hear that there's not enough dialogue between corporates, researchers and policy makers, local authorities. What did you learn from this lab and what did it teach you? If you think that Société Générale, perhaps you'll be able to tell us more about this. Société Générale wants to be mobilized increasingly in this field of biodiversity, not just in Mediterranean, but to see the Mediterranean as a laboratory where they could explore aspects that could be duplicated elsewhere. Thank you very much, Samir. I found this laboratory very interesting, in, firstly, in its approach. We can't do things by ourselves, as you were saying. I think there's a lot of value in working in partnership together, in getting people involved as stakeholders. And I think that that's very important. And that's what brings us together. And this is how we work with the Société Générale, we have Grow with Africa program. I think that Société Générale is very present in Africa and our number one mission is to support um, sustainable developments in this country. So there's the Grow with Africa company um, and the with here is very meaningful. It's inclusive through partnerships. And what's very interesting is that we've extended this approach of Grow with Africa to different sectors. We work a lot on sustainability, but biodiversity is a crucial aspect within that. This group developed a different approach to what we had previously, which was more about supporting big companies. Here we want to have more inclusive approach that is perhaps more daring with greater impact we want to have a very local presence in order to better embody what we what we are wanting to do. What I can say is that in terms of the support that we can offer to these green businesses, if I could call them that, we have that La Maison des PME, the House of SMEs, which provides advice and support for new businesses working in biodiversity or other aspects in Africa. We also have hubs in Ivory Coast with structured funding bodies, working through partnerships with development banks such as Proparco, AFD, BA, the African Development Bank, in order to go further in what we can do 
in terms of green funding, and that is crucial. What we're also trying to develop in a bit more of a daring way, if I could say, is the impact-based approach. When we see an opportunity, we want to see the impacts that has, and we want to monetize the impact in order to make a project more bankable, if you like, in order to use traditional banking technology in order to attract other private investors. So these are these innovative structures that allow us to go further in our commitment to biodiversity. You were also talking a lot about what this lab taught us. I have the ambition to support African startups with all of our systems that we've had in place through Green Bomb, Blue Bomb, right down to the smallest businesses, the startups. For biodiversity, we're talking about oceans here. And we want to create a whole fabric of the, econ the blue economy. And yesterday it was great to see the most relevant themes. There was a real consensus found around aquaculture, which was a reality for the Mediterranean Sea, but also in other countries in sub-Saharan Africa. And also for circular economy, uh, recycling, etc. So I found confirmation within that. And we need innovation within this. I think that the Mediterranean could be a kind of proof of concept for this, which would help us to develop solutions, which could then be scaled up across the African continent, which we could incorporate within Société Générale, working with partners like Business Angels, Fabric City, perhaps ourselves as well, in a form of blended finance in order to support these new businesses with the solutions that they're proposing, such as aquaculture and plastic recycling within the blue economy. That's what I wanted to share with you, Samia. Thank you very much. I'll come back to you later. So Société Générale wants to organize an oceans hackathon. Why couldn't Marseille and the Mediterranean be a laboratory for this hackathon? A dynamic was launched yesterday in any case with a shared observation. Operators are looking to get involved. Société Générale, we can see the Presidential Council for Africa, private um, institutions and companies um, like uh, the Oceanographic Puerto Rica Institute, the Canal de Provence. I'm going to go back um, to you now, um, um, Valérie Noël. Noël you, 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 in, you embody um, the, the foundation and the institute here. What did you learn yesterday during this lab? Were you Im impressed? by a South African incubator and have you identified any shared difficulties in Mediterranean and, and Africa that we could launch initiatives like um, a hackathon? People always say that the Mediterranean is a model ocean for the marine environment and human interactions. It's a very small laboratory. You're talking earlier about um, the, the link between mankind and seas. The Mediterranean is especially rich in biodiversity, but it's suffering a lot from the pressure, pressure of, of human activity. So if we're able to implement aspects in the Mediterranean with nature-based solutions or community-driven project, this could be then transferred elsewhere. I was very happy yesterday in this laboratory to see, like Sarah was saying, that people are starting to understand what their role is. And we're going to be able to accelerate that together. But we should not forget that 
the big challenges of looking after the environment is is an urgent matter and it's very complex so we're going to need digital acceleration in order to build demonstrators to train the teachers and this find public private funding it's the sectors of tomorrow and the jobs of tomorrow that are going to be created and we should not forget that it's the biodiversity of today that is supporting a lot of economies in the Mediterranean aquaculture craftsmanship tourism we owe almost everything to biodiversity so it's not just about saving biodiversity it's about saving the ecosystem services that they provide and what I really liked um, with this this topic of oceans was that people don't necessarily understand the fundamental role of oceans in climate change mitigation in with Posidonia seagrass for instance in Tunisia they can compensate for um, oxygen um, depletion so this is a this is a shared good that needs to be studied we need to have studies in order to build resilient economies we also saw that we've gone from food security which is crucial in uh, Africa with this demographic growth how can we feed all these young people but also the notion of food sovereignty how can we create protein that does not make climate change work which worse which was can feed people in a healthy and traceable way um, and get much more consumers so we're being um, we're going to be inspired by ecosystems in the future aquaculture um, is great but we forget that wild fish are feeding aquaculture so we're seeing a collapse of fish stocks through um, this five times increase in in aquaculture this has an impact in oceans in local on local communities as well there's an effect here because the market is requiring a lot of wild fish you cannot you can replace this by insect flower the insect sector is is taking off these are the sectors of tomorrow the economy of tomorrow if you're feeding fish through insects you don't have as you're solving some problems of agri agricultural waste as well you have a huge circular economy forming here where fish can also be incorporated so by taking inspiration from nature where there is no waste you're able to create protein without using water without going around the whole world and by eating traceable fish that are of a good quality and I think that all stakeholders can find their role in this virtuous cycle thank you we're going to go back to what these stakeholders are saying and how local areas can can catalyze this and uh, vice president uh, you're going to go back to how this territory is going to position itself in uh, this axis but we're lucky to have entrepreneurs with us that embody this green entrepreneurship and are showing what the Bouche du Rhône department is doing through its entrepreneurship in biodiversity. We are lucky. Ange, can you hear us? Are you connected? Yes, I'm connected. Great. I was worried. Ange, you know the region very well. You're an Ivory Coast uh, entrepreneur. You've contributed a lot to biodiversity through your innovation. And you have chosen to live in the Bouche du Rhône, not far from Aix en Provence, near Cabriès, uh, near Le Camp. Your company, Cinelux, has chosen to come to our territory. Could you talk to us more about your solution for a few minutes and explain why you've chosen to innovate here in Provence from Ivory Coast, Abidjan? Thank you, Samir. Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for this opportunity to get involved with all of these actions that are focused on the environment. So I um, the founder of Cinelux. It's a company which works in biodiversity and tries to f foster 
the integration of energy into people's uses on a day-to-day -day basis by using renewable energies and light. And why do we do that? Well, by using these kind of technologies and communication with light, we actually noticed that it was possible to recreate the natural world for the ecosystems in the ocean. So we looked at lighting and we wanted to try and recreate this ecosystem for biodiversity and to look at the needs to in reproducing this. We developed an autonomous solar solution that will help stakeholders both preserve the environment and use green technology that doesn't consume in conventional energy, so it's much cleaner and will have a much better impact on the environment. We're able to generate energy, transfer skills and use energy uh, capturers, uh, solar panels and all of the activities that we have uh, that are based around carbon impact have helped us to measure our actions that have a, shall we say, um, positive impact on the environment. So by using these energy capturers and these specific tools, we have been able to measure the impact that carbon has had and specifically the carbon that we use during our own operations as well as gas and um, unmanaged fishing have actually had on the environment. So that is why we have decided to set up in uh, the Provence Metropole and we have developed and implemented solutions with the local metropolitans and we've been using uh, the knowledge of local entrepreneurs as well. Thank you so much for this testimonial. It's very inspiring. It's a, you're very you're a great anim, you're a great fam, uh, a great friend of the territory. I'm going to move over to Jean-Marc Philippe who is a major stakeholder in ocean management, both in the Mediterranean and internationally. You have just come back from Dhaka in Senegal. I'd like to hear about it. Today, how has your company and the department been able to innovate and come up with concrete solutions to the problems that you address? Could you talk about that with us, please? Of course, yes, thank you very much. Hello again, everyone. To answer your question, Samir, I would like to do ecology and economy, which is comparable. I would like to continue on from what some of my colleagues have been saying by talking about um, certain territories, territories which are confronted by climate change and, manage and water management. Provence is an incredible territory with uh, an amazing biodiversity. Didier was saying this earlier on. There's an, a very ancient way of managing the water in the territory, especially the water that comes all the way down from the Alps and has been doing so for millennia. This is something that we've been able to make use of. And uh, the Bouche du Rhone department is not the first structure to be doing so. We have many people who are working on ma water management for over a century. So in Provence, we have this ability to m manage water in an extremely ecological way for both drinkable water, irrigation in, a an, agricult in an agricultural and territory such as the one that we live in for growing fruit and vegetables and also for industry. So this is for the situation in Provence, cities like Marseille and Aix-en-Provence. In Africa, there are the same issues. So if I were to try and compare this with the basin in Senegal, we can say that, um, well, actually there are the issues such as how to build dams and how can we answer the local needs? And I know that in Sub-Saharan Africa, 
water is, of course, and specifically drinking water, an, incre an incredibly important aspect. We have over 18 million people who need drinking water. And of course, that's not forgetting irrigation. Irrigation over 300,000 hectares of agricultural land. Because in Provence, we irrigate almost 250,000 hectares of agricultural land. So we actually have a similar um, surface area of agricultural land that we need to manage. So both sides of the Mediterranean are actually setting up certain tools to better manage the flow of water, to then be able to irrigate agricultural land and ensure the territories are self-sufficient for their water needs. As I mentioned earlier, I'd like to talk about drinkable water. Well, Marseille is a is a, a, a great example across the whole world. We have uh, experienced terrible plagues in the past and we managed to get past them. So this is exactly what we need for our pa African partners. What interests me in Africa is the rural aspect. The the issues in rural areas are huge. There is a great deal of wealth and, and development ability, which is incredibly large. And we need to be able to manage the resources effectively. In Provence, we were able to export the Ocean um, model, thanks to, for example, SNEF, which is one of our partners, as well as several different SMEs. And we've been able to bring drinking water to people who need it. We've been able to go and gather water, make it drinkable, and then bring it to the end users. If we looked at the uh, the north area of Burkina Faso, it's not the same picture, of course. Uh, drinking water is more difficult to manage, and we need to have good pilot projects in place with local stakeholders who are managing them to ensure that drinking water is available for the local population. So, to build a bridge, if you like, between Marseille and Burkina Faso, digital technology and digital tools are essential, are an essential part of managing water. And I like very much like the, the projects which pilot um, irrigation we have um, local products such as pistachios and almonds, which are grown in Burkina Faso and Cameroon. And this production, shall we say, actually manages to feed local populations and provide jobs as well. So that's great. Thank you so much, Jean-Marc. We're very much talking about green entrepreneurs at the moment. Valérie Noel. You have been managing innovation for alternative bunkers. How can you finance and support this type of project? We heard Ange Balmar talk about his company. In Côte d'Ivoire, in Ivory Coast these days, they want to try and co-construct projects with Provence, just like the type of projects that Jean-Marc has mentioned. Ocean is looking at implementing projects between Provence and Senegal, and they need corporate partners to do so. So how can the Société Générale position itself on this type of project, please? Thank you for the question. As I was saying earlier on, for this kind of project, which is kind of in biodiversity, I would say that we have a wide range of tools and support tools and finance tools that we have available to us. Our network works in eight different jurisdictions and I think that it's very important to incorporate all of these type of tools in these type of projects with the entrepreneurs that we're dealing with because this type of support that comes from local councils, uh, as I've been part of them in the past, uh, can really make a huge impact and really greatly Im uh, influence SMEs. 
I think it's ex this is an extremely important aspect of the issue. We have also decided to allocate certain area, certain uh, percentage of our activity to supporting SMEs. As I was saying earlier on as well, sometimes funding and opportunities can be difficult to apprehend with the classical tools. Investors might think that the sectors are too high risk, for example, and as I was saying earlier on, it's impossible to do anything by oneself. We need to have partnerships with the right people to enable these structures to improve their operations. Of course, these uh, operations need to be much more ap attractive for investors to want to get involved. We have venture capital, private equity, which are both involved as well. So the fact that we have teams that are specialized in finance in, for example, Ivory Coast, it enables us to have a, a really important franchise for development banks as well and partnerships that the social that the Société Générale has and these are very impactful as well. I would like to say that also we have partnerships with multinationals and corporates in the regions as well. We have a participation with INP as well and the teams that work there. And actually, we have been participating equity to projects that the INP has been undertaking. INP uh, actually has uh, established themselves as uh, an extremely important partner and they're very comfortable working with us on these projects. So, Having an impact-based approach is, as we were saying earlier on, um, all about establishing a project which enables companies to have a positive impact on local areas. The profile of tra transactions which can be more bankable is really the, the, the main goal in what we're trying to do in Africa. We want to go beyond the level of support that we're able to propose companies at the moment, specifically for areas that are actually new on the scene as well. Ones that use uh, maybe traditional tools for financing and trying to get investment. Sometimes these old models are not that effective. We need to modernize, we need to come up with new tools, we need to use digital technology and so entrepreneurs who embody SMEs. We want to work with them. We want to establish partnerships with them. We want to try and give them a sort of sweetener to their operations to make them more bankable. Yeah, that's very clear. Thank you very much. I think that Auchan has also been supported by banking uh, investment and banking finance in the past as Auchan or Cinelux uh, really represent the new financing mechanisms. I'd like to talk about the question of the L Biodiversity Laboratoire that the Provence area has implemented. So, Patricia, I'd like to come back to you next and ask you about the position you have with local politics and local government. We really hope that we'll be able to rely on you and the, and the work that you do at the WWF as well. What kind of position does the presidency that you work with and what kind of uh, what kind of impact do they have for biodiversity? How can we get on board with all of these stakeholders that are united here today, such as Ange Balma? And how can we get involved in the next big meeting to coming to come together and come up with solutions for the future?
So with regards to the Presidential Council for Africa, our role since 2017 has, to, has been to represent the public across many different topics. The first of which is the environment, and we work in the environment with three main areas. For example, sustainable cities, the Sommet France that was supposed to happen in Bordeaux last year was meant to come up with a, a wide range of questions about biodiversity because we know that urbanization is one of the major causes of the dis, uh, the dis the dispersal of biodiversity and the disappearance of local and certain uh, of local species we have been able to support during the preparation of the one planet on biodiversity biodiversity a solution which we want to implement in sub sub saharan africa with a financing of 16 billion euros The goal of this was to implement a new strategy to try and engage in the private sector. This is a very precise example, which has been around for the last 15 years, be, whereby normally it's uh, what well, we can see very clearly that it's the local governments and states are not able to reach the objectives that they have set themselves by themselves. They need private investment, they need to get involved with private stakeholders. On the 8th of July this year, we will be uh, organizing a summit where we'll be looking at how to get civil society and private the private sector engaged in answering these different problems. And it's very important for us to discuss all of these issues together, regardless of whether we are whether we are in Marseille or Tunis. The environment, the environmental considerations are pretty much the same. As we're in the Mediterranean, I would like to underline the importance of the plan that re that brings together four main topics and is presided over by Karim Amelal, who is the president of the Mediterranean uh, Fund. And in this plan, he has aimed to get not only the states involved, but also stakeholders to get on board with uh, solutions to solve biodiversity problems and marine problems. By 2030, the development of sustainable fishing is an important key factor as well to put an end to industrial fishing that is very damaging to the environment. When we talk about fishing, we can very clearly see the link between biodiversity and, econ and the economy. In Tunisia, fishing represents 13% of the GDP. So when we have 13% of the economy which um, collapses, we, that's something we really need to address. We need to preserve the local resources and uh, ensure that we continue working on things like recycling plastic waste, where we have 29 million tons of plastic just in the Tunisian Ocean that is thrown, that is, uh, thrown into the sea and needs to be recycled. We need to continue working on how on fighting climate change and uh, making people aware of how important it is to protect and preserve our oceans these are the main topics of the presidential council for europe its main highlights and its main priorities so the 8th to the 10th of july in montpellier we hope to come up with some solutions to the problems in the projects that we have undertaken and we hope that we have some good results. Yes, and we hope that as well and perhaps with the uh, Société Générale or why not, uh, we could all work together and uh, Patricia and Jean-Marc, uh, I think that now we have 
a way of positioning the territory here. All stakeholders can contribute to this objective. And before moving back, uh, handing back over to you, Patricia, I think it's important to 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 hear Ange Frédéric Belma the model, the role as a model, role model that you uh, have at the moment, how can we inspire others? How can we support and accelerate the emergence of 10, 20, 30, 100 uh, of the next Sinilux in Africa that people who will follow in, in your footsteps and develop Euro-African startups that will be shared between the two continents? Thank you very much, Samir. I think that's what we started. Our main purpose was to inspire entrepreneurs. We know that between the capacity and resilience of the entrepreneur, that's what will make the difference faced with COVID, faced with all the economic and financial consequences of that, we remained resilient. And we can encourage future generations of entrepreneurs by supporting them, being alongside them, sharing the experience that we had through our life as entrepreneurs and also being there for them, providing them with this technological building block, but also a human building block that we have through initiatives such as Emerging Valley, where we've been able to get into contact with investors, partners, and perhaps even move to Provence, simply because there was this desire to create things. And I think that this desire needs to go well beyond words. We need concrete actions. We need funding. And if you want to, then we can do it. And as entrepreneurs, we have the desire to bring things forward. The entrepreneurs are experimenting at the moment with green solutions. We can think bigger and develop more and more green solutions in order to preserve all of our ecosystems. Thank you very much, Ange Frederica. We are soon going to reveal these revelations, but Pat Patricia, our... Uh, you're our big sister here in this in this lab. Lots of things have been said through this collective intelligence work and this tab round table with its exciting and interesting comments, discussions. How can we make sure that everything that we've said, all of these recommendations and this desire, this willpower be concretely put into place? I'd like to say something for once, sustainable development is going to be very profitable. Everything that we're implementing at the moment with these researcher, entrepreneur, innovative finance partnerships, we're not just creating the jobs of future, the future, the sectors of the future, but also the vital resources of the future. So biodiversity is no longer an environmental constraint or something that we need to preserve because it's pretty. It's this notion of of heritage. It's, it's an asset. And I think for the first time, we're understanding that environments, the environment and living things are linked together. And the insurance that we're going to have is that we're going to have a new perspective on biodiversity. You cannot have species if you do not preserve spaces. So this is going to have a snowball effect. And the economy is going to repair nature because we're going to realize how essential it is. And for the moment, I do not know anybody who knows how to make flies, fish, dolphins. This is a real treasure. And we're understanding what the, the value of, of, of living being is. Thank you very much, Patricia. Um, would you would you like to, to say something else, Didier? Yes, I think... Um, Jean-Marc, sorry, I think we need to, to have public and private sector working together. We have these big uh, big organizations and governments, but we need SMEs from both continents that learn to work together. We're leading this in um, Provence with um, an African network. I'm working with SMEs, Nabajan, Dakar, Ouagadougou. 
there's lots of talent, but there's also a lot of difficulties for these companies and our own for development. I think there's a real challenge here in biodiversity to support one another with these African SMEs who are also working on their own on these topics. We need to think about this business between European companies and African companies. Thank you very much, Jean-Marc. Yes, uh, the territorial networks are often front runners, trailblazers. Um, Mr. Didier Réau, could you tell us some of the recommendations for action that have come from this collective intelligence lab? This is only the start. We can say we're going to go further with all of these stakeholders, the Presidential Council of Africa, Société Générale, startups, Bal like Balma, Cinelux, the um, Canal de Provence company, Oshun. What recommendations can you share? Will be in the Emerging Valley booklet. These are not my ideas. These are the ideas of the lab that we did yesterday. The nine clusters we used the word uh, cluster here with the nine clusters of ideas that we identified, we selected four. And to follow on from what Patricia and Jean-Marc were saying, what is going to be the most important is for everybody to share where possible the same the same perception of what nature is and the advantage of biodiversity. So this as the first series of ideas that we had is was awareness raising, tra training and education or school children, but we needed ident identified audience leaders, project leaders, business managers, non-profits, or perhaps mayors of local authorities here in Provence, but also in African countries who also need awareness raising or systems to preserve the nature and biodiversity. This was the first piece of information that we identified. The second aspect was a cluster on impact targeting biodiversity. So this was about the creation of marine protected areas and the development of these areas, but also insisting on the fact that a marine protected area is not just about identifying it and hoping that it will be okay. There's resources that need to be implemented, human resources, knowledge, which require intelligence. And then we're, we're back on this topic of, of, of needing researchers and also data acquisition. We were talking about that earlier. The third cluster was the impact of sustainable fishing and the preservation of maritime ecosystems, which included all activities, particularly industrial fishing and overfishing, maritime transport, shipping and the impact, negative impact that can have on our oceans, particularly in the Mediterranean. And also Patricia was talking about this earlier, the Posidonia seagrass, which um, is impacted by yachting and um, cruise ships. So thank you for the decrees that have been implemented in the Mediterranean to make sure that larger yachts are not able to to go close to the coastlines. This is because local authorities and the state have wanted to implement something across the entire Mediterranean coastline. We now have a local procedure as well for the Calanque. In Provence, we have its own, uh, its own uh, mooring regulations. So the state is also a way of um, bringing about change and we often criticize but they can bring about good change as well. The last cluster was cons responsible consumption and production. These, This comes back to what we were talking about, about short um, economic circuits and we want sustainable de de development in areas like S Sarah was saying, not just for production which can create jobs, but also 
to have sustainable consumption for part of the population. Here in Provence and more generally in Europe, we are starting to understand our mistakes in this field. We're starting to see how we could change our behavior that we've had for many years. I think all French and Mediterranean territories have realized that the COVID-19 crisis has accelerated this awareness. We have partners who can do this, state partners, the water agency, the water agencies are excellent partners for developing sustainable solutions. We're working at a catchment area level and the management of a catchment area is fundamental for water management and water is fundamental for biodiversity. So that's another message we need to communicate. We're not on it, working in micro communities and micro areas like Provence, it's perhaps a little bit unusual. Often everybody is working uh, on the basis of I've paid for my water, but that's no longer enough. We need a system. We're in a catchment area that goes from, from Nice up to Perpignan. The catchment area, this is the catchment area in which we, we work and live. This is the Rhone Mediterranean catchment area. So this was the the observations that we made. Secondly, we wanted to identify the contributions of different stakeholders, researchers, entrepreneurs, financial partners, policy makers and administrations. The observation was that we all had good intentions. We all had arguments, we all had data and our own language, but we were lacking bridges and I'm sure that Emerging Valley is one of those bridges now. We And we'll need to develop other bridges in order to speak the same language. Do we need artificial intelligence for that? I don't know, but we need to bring together our languages and our arguments in order to better understand what we're saying and find solutions and to conclude because I think we're coming to the end now. I would like to come back to what Patricia and Jean-Marc were saying and all of our other speakers. I'm going to try to bring the ecology closer to the economy because we use the same word. Nature is a source of wealth. And we can develop that through biodiversity and the benefits that creates. If we start eating at away at this wealth of, of, of biodiversity, there's going to be less and less for everybody. In Europe and in France, there's real there's a real desire to go back to preserving nature and biodiversity. Some people think that it's never enough, but we are moving forward. All stakeholders are working on this topic, financial partners, but also local authorities, the metropolis here, Ex Marseille Provence, the département, and we could develop a lot of arguments. But we need this ability to support the right networks, the right systems, to inform more than just knowledge, we need to get projects financed through calls for projects. There are so many organizations that do calls for projects, water agencies, the metropolis, the département, Caisse des dépôts et de consignation. I'm just giving you some examples which are the best known. People are developing systems and mechanisms that we don't know. The Conservatoire du Littoral has a system called SMILO, a meeting of, of small islands across the Mediterranean where we're not finding, bringing solutions. It's the Tunisian islands, Algerian, Libyan islands, Lebanese islands that are saying how they successfully saved water resources and we're trying to implement that on the Il Frioul in Marseille or, or Rio, for instance. So we also have knowledge that we need to take from our African and Mediterranean partners. The final point, and I'll finish up in the Mediterranean, 
is that it's 1% of the global marine area, but it's 17,000 species. So we have a concentration in such a small territory here. This is incredible to acquire data, to understand it, to process this data in an extremely effective way because it's very con concentrated. So let's make the most of that and let's try to align. So let me finish here so that data can be applied to the Mediterranean between Europe and Africa. Thank you very much, Didier Riol, Vice President of the Departmental Council. I'd say data, data, action, and we're all going to put this into action. Thank you very much for this session. Thank you very much, Patricia. Thank you very much, Jean-Marc. Ange Balma, Valérie Noël. I know that Ange, uh, it was difficult for you to find time, so thank you very much for finding the time and the connection. Valérie Noël Okojo, thank you for being with us and sharing your vision, and we're all going to be working together. Thank you, Sarah Toumi, as well. Thank you. All of these discussions are going to be in the white papers of Emerging Valley that will be published in a few months' time, and we are going to set a date to continue work from this lab with the Paul Rica Institute, with the um, Council for Presidential Council for Africa, with um, Ange Frédéric, with the, also with the Société Générale and the next meeting beyond the Montpellier um, uh, summit is going to be the Marseille summit with the summit of the two shores in Marseille at the end of the year. Thank you very much, Samia. Thank you, everybody. Goodbye.